session of the day, which, which will be devoted to a discussion of exceptions and limitations in copyright and what appears, at least from the title of this session, as an uncertain scope of copyright in the digital sphere. Uh, the three panelists in this session are uh, from uh, my left hand side, Linda Scales, who is a solicitor uh, with uh, uh, a long experience in intellectual property, particularly copyright. Uh, Cedric Manara, who is a copyright counsel at Google and is uh, based in Paris. And uh, finally, uh, to the very end of the table, uh, Sarah Folder, who is uh, the CEO of the Publishers Licensing Society and uh, has uh, worked uh, previously at a law firm and in the music industry. So uh, they will provide uh, different perspectives on exceptions and limitations and I'm sure that uh, this uh, will allow a lively and interesting uh, discussion with you and also uh, among the panelists. So let's start uh, with uh, Linda who will provide a uh, perspective on exceptions from a practitioner's standpoint. Okay, well, the title of the practitioner perspective is a bit of a cop out, really, but it's very useful when you haven't quite decided what you want to talk about. Um, but perhaps in the light of the number of academics uh, on panels and in the room today, maybe the practitioner perspective does offer something different. Uh, what I eventually decided to do was to look at issues arising, arising on the intersection of Irish and European law. Uh, and where exceptions are concerned, what that, that largely involves the way in which Ireland transposed the directives. Um, I say directives rather than directive because obviously there are exceptions in more than one directive. But at, at, uh, at the heart of this one, obviously, is the Information Society Directive, or what I'd probably call InfoSoft, uh, as most of us do. And uh, so largely I'm going to look at the way in which we transposed InfoSoft in terms of the exceptions. Um, so. I'm sure you're all intimately familiar with the exceptions in the Information Society Directive. Um, you, we, we know it's, I just, just by way of scene setting, it's a closed list. Um, there is one mandatory exception, uh, which is for the transient and incidental use, technological uses. And there's five optional exceptions to the reproduction right. In addition, there's 14 optional exceptions to both the rights of reproduction and communication to the public. There's that nice, curious right at the end, which could be a catch-all or could mean a lot or a little, which is a right to retain existing minor exceptions in national law. Uh, and then there's a provision that all of them must comply with the international three-step test. So I know Giuseppe doesn't like asking questions in these um, presentations, but if I, give you the if I provide the answers to the questions, I think he'll probably allow me to do this. Do we have to have all of those exceptions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am? Any contrary views? No, we don't have to have all those exceptions. The ex you, may, you may have all of the exceptions, but it's, it's well established now. We do not have to have all of them. It is an optional list, except for the one mandatory exception. Can we have others in addition to these? Well, can we have others in addition to these? Well, we did look at the possibility that uh, we could have the right to retain minor exceptions. But in fact, no. Other than these, we can't have others other than the list in the directive, uh, unless it comes with falls within the category of minor. Can the exceptions be narrower, do you think? Can they be narrower? Yes, I think they can be. They can be narrower. But you do have to remember that to the extent to which they are narrower, cuts down uh, you, you're on the scope of, of uh, you're, you're enlarging the scope by cutting down the size of the exception. Uh, can the exceptions be broader? <laughs> Class. <laughs> you're not doing very well. Yes, yes apart from the mandatory one. The exceptions cannot be broader. Okay, let's look now at Ireland's transposition. And when I come to my next set of questions, hopefully you'll be a little more awake. Um, <laughs> how did we transpose the directive? Well, we, we, we did some interesting things with it, I think we could say. Um, we took some new exceptions directly from the directive. For example, we introduced, we, we introduced quite a lot over and above what was in the 1963 Act. We took some new ones directly from the directive. We took, for example, an exception for quotation, and we took the exception for incidental inclusion. We took those directly from the directive. Uh, others we tried to fit into, we kind of did a lot of bolting on and 
uh, fiddling with others and tried to fit them into the format of existing exceptions. And that arises in particular in relation, for example, to the fair, fair dealing exceptions. The fair dealing exceptions were at the heart of the exceptions in the 1963 Act. We did add, which the, you don't have in the UK, a definition of the meaning of fair dealing, which imported part but not all of the three-step test. But other than that, we tried to fit our fair, fair dealing exceptions into the new framework. We copied some from the UK, in particular the Library and Archives exception, and in fact, that was already an outdated exception in UK law, so it wasn't really a particularly appropriate act of copying. And then finally we re rejected others, and one is tempted to the conclusion that we rejected anything that encouraged the need for compensation to the right holder, because the two main ones that we rejected there were the general reprographic uh, exception and the private copying exception. Um, and both of those would have involved the need to consider the issue of fair compensation to the right holder. So that seems to me to be the way we looked on the, the act of transposition. I decided I'd try and score it. Um, and what I would do is I'd try to score our approximation of the exceptions in the directive. So what I decided I would do is I would take the directive exceptions, take the ones in the, in the directive, and I'd look at how we transposed those. Um, and I awarded 10 out of 10 for something that was transposed effectively on all fours of the directive, and 0 out of 10, not for something that was left out because they are optional exceptions, but for something that was, uh, so, there was such a significant difference in the transposition uh, that it was really material. So this is the scorecard. Of the 20, this is the scorecard I came out with. There's over four of them that are on all fours with the exception in the directive, uh, and so forth, all the way down there. As a mathematician, I know Fred will answer me this question. What percentage does that give you 20%. on your exam paper? Four out, of, four out of 20? No, not four out of 20. On that overall scorecard, we've t uh, four with 10 out of 10, we've two with nine out of 10. Um, are you going to do that? <laughs> Perhaps my questions are a little bad. Okay, I can, on, on, a rough, on a rough guess, what would you say that comes out at? Just looking at it there. 60%, 50. Yeah, somewhere between 50 and 60%. Uh, <coughs> in fact, it's closer to 60 than it is, I think, to 50. It's 114 out of 200, which is, um, <clears throat> is how it works out. On a, on, a, on a school score, is that is that a, a B or a C? Or, I mean, we have the academics here. What is it? C. It's a C. Okay, so at this point, yeah. six, six, on a 60%, is it only a C? Yeah. Okay, <coughs> so uh, we're only a C there. That's not so great. Um, and we're not finished because we have to hold on a second because we have to look at the fact that there are exceptions which derive no authority. There are exceptions in the Act, the Copyright and Related Right Rights Act 2000, uh, that derive no, no authority at all from the Information Society, that are out the, uh, outside the ambit of the directive and therefore are precluded uh, or ought to be precluded under national law. I, my estimate was I counted about seven of the minor, what might be characterised as the minor uses, and one of them, for example, is reading a recitation by one person of a reasonable extract from a work in public. Uh, very minor use. So there was about seven of those, but there are at least four that weren't so minor or aren't so minor. Of those, two of them have already been struck down. Uh, one is the public lending right exception that was in Section 58, which is a really broad derogation from the public lending right uh, for educational establishments and establish public establishments to which the public had access. Uh, and at the behest of the Commission, um, we altered our law, Ireland altered our law by a small piece of legislation uh, to remove that, uh, to alter that exception. A second one that has already been struck down is the use of sound recordings, in, in, in sound recordings and broadcasts in hotel bedrooms. Um, and that was the case of uh, PPI um, versus Ireland and the UK. Uh, that was actually both of these were actually actually or have to be had to be seen or were evaluated in the light of the Redfin Lending Right Directive rather than Infosoc. But uh, the use of sound recording in, in hotel bedrooms in the, the exception in section ninety seven has also been struck down, but the law hasn't been changed yet. The issue was whether or not that was a communication to the public, um, and it was held to be a communication to the public, and therefore required the payment of equitable remuneration, and therefore the exception uh, failed. So. Those two, both of those two have failed. There's at least another two, in my view, on demonstrable risk. Uh, the first of those is in section 51 and 2, where you have a fair dealing exception for research and private study. So fair dealing for research and private study. Um, 
But if you look at the uh, comparable um, permitted exception in the directive, it's Article 5.3a, it permits an exception for scientific research but limited to non-commercial purposes. Ours is not limited to non-commercial purposes. This was recognised, we copied our law in this respect, our fair dealing exceptions come from the 1956 UK Act, uh, where it was fair dealing, research for, fair dealing exemption for research and private study. And uh, the UK recognised this, and in 2003 they altered the uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act to limit the exception to commercial uses. So uh, that, to my view, is a demonstrable risk in relation to that exception. A second one of more limited relevance, I suppose, here is, is Section 103, retransmission of the must-carry broadcasts. There's an exception which allows uh, the retransmission, the intercep interception and retransmission of the must-carry content obligation of broadcasters. Um, it was originally introduced into uh, our law to deal with shadow areas of the transmission in rural parts, uh, but it's still there, and the question is, uh, is it still valid? Um, they, it arose in the UK in the context of the TV catch-up case, where TV catch-up was intercepting and streaming um, broadcasts, and the question was whether or not that was an act of communication to the public. That question went in and back out to Europe and back again. Uh, but the section, the, the equivalent, there's an equivalent exception on all fours with our section 103 in the UK Act, which is in section 73. That aspect the uh, ability to boost or retransmit uh, <coughs> was not referred by the UK court to the uh, European, uh, to the CJEU, but in fact very recently, in 2015, has very late in the day in the TV catch-up case, now been referred to the CJEU. So, if section 73 fails in Europe uh, in relation to the issue, then obviously it, it demolishes our exception as well. So, how about the scorecard now? Are we dropping? Better, I think. Oh, I think we're dropping. On approximation, well, we've minor uses, four not so minor. We've had to, we've had to lose two already, so we've been smacked twice. Yes. And we have two further smacks possibly coming up. Um, so are we, are we improving on our score to see? Anyway, I'll leave that one with you because I'll run out of time. I need to think for so long. Okay, well, is there anything else? Yes. Exceptions can only be measured by reference to the scope of protection. And if you curtail the scope of protection, obviously space is created for additional things which you can call exceptions. They may not be characterised in the legislation as exceptions, but they are effectively exceptions by an indirect route. And an important example of this is... Um, a, a distinction, it, 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 it touches on one of the kind of kernel uh, principles in copyright law, in, common, in the common law, and that is uh, the right that, the, that the right of the right holder exists in relation to the work as a whole or to any substantial part of the work. Okay? Um, so historically, and um, insubstantial uses or minor uses of a work have regarded as being excluded from the scope uh, of the right of the entitlement to the right holder. But if you look, if you compare what's in the Information Society Directive, for example, in relation to the reproduction right, with what's in the Copyright and Related Rights Act, you see in, in, in InfoSoc we have the reproduction right is defined as the exclusive right to authorise or prohibit direct or indirect temporary or permanent reproduction by any means in any form, in whole or in part. Right? Compare that with, with what's in our Act, the exclusive right to copy the work, but this refers to the work as a whole or to any substantial part of the work. So you see the difference. Um, so again, that's something actually which uh, was addressed uh, in InfoPAC, which we'll come to, I hope, uh, in just a second. But there is a, there's a significant difference there between what's in the directive and what's in our act. Um, I mean, can, I can ask you whether or not you think that our, our, the provision in our act is still valid <coughs> in the light of InfoPAC. Okay, we come to it. One last point. There's yet another an important uh, 
thing that could be regarded as an exception. And this is an Irish solution to an Irish question, of course. It's not a proper exception at all. What's a grace and favour exception? But we don't have an exception for, pri for private copying. We have two very limited um, allowances. One is fair dealing for private study, and the other is time shifting of broadcasts. But other than that, what do we do about our private copying? We motor on and do our private copying. So it's a kind of grace and favour ex exception that exists. Now, in the UK, they take things sometimes a little more seriously than we do. And uh, they attempted, as you, I'm sure you are aware, to introduce a private copying. The issue about the private copying exception is a, a, the, there is the, um, the opportunity. The InfoSoc provides for, the issue behind it is that the InfoSoc provides for a private copying exception. But it's subject to payment of fair compensation to the right holder. Okay? So what they, and that's the issue, I suppose, behind our reluctance. We didn't want to have to introduce private copying levies, which they have all over Europe, mm -hmm. to deal with a private copying exception. What they have attempted to do in the UK, what they did attempt to do in the UK was introduce an exception, which was not subject to payment of compensation, and that relied on a recital in the directive, which said, indicated that if there was no harm to the right holder, it might not be necessary to pay compensation. So the UK framed an exception along those lines, but it's been struck down by the High Court in the UK. Um, I gather it's under appeal. Uh, and meanwhile, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the government has withdrawn the strategy instrument introducing the, uh, the private copying exception. So, um, but the situation now in the UK is, is, is the same as ours here. To the extent that we don't introduce a formal exception because we don't want to address the levy issue, private copying is all infringing. So that's another area where there's a pretty significant divergence between uh, our law and, what, uh, and, and the uh, provisions of the directive. Um, do we need to look at that scorecard again? Are we dropping? We're dropping. We're dropping, <laughs> We're dropping fairly fast. What's a pass mark? A D? 40. 40. Is that a D? <laughs> Are we down to a D? Are we down below a D, would you say? Well, it depends if you're UCD. <laughs> right, okay. That's a very good point, actually. <laughs> Trinity or UCD is a different thing. Um, so, that's... I have to... The issue then arises as to whether or not we can keep our exceptions. Um, and in that regard, we actually... Uh, there's reform coming up, obviously. Uh, but we need to look at what the role of the, of the uh, CJU has been in the meanwhile because it's relevant to the question whether or not we can, what can we keep and the extent to which we can keep our existing exceptions. Obviously, most of you will be aware that the CJU is increasingly eroding the discretion of the national legislature and the courts. Um, one of the most dramatic examples of that in an Irish context was InfoPAC because uh, it, it involved, you probably will know, the question of whether a keyword and five words each side of it would infringe copyright. That was a classic case of insubstantial use, it's probably under Irish law, as it was at the time. But the CJE found that it was capable of infringement. The court said nothing in InfoSoc, there is nothing in InfoSoc indicating that parts are to be treated any differently from the work as a whole. Therefore, it closed the door pretty firmly on, on our insubstantial uses exception. It also, the court also took another breathtaking leap um, in plucking the originality standard out of the database directive and the uh, software directive and the term directive and plonking it into the, into the information society directive, introducing, changing our whole uh, a yardstick for um, uh, originality. So instead of our old standard, uh, or at least our, um, our um, labour skill and judgment test we now have the author's own intellectual creation. So that's the most dramatic example of probably how one case has changed our national law. In addition, you have... How much time have I got left? Uh, I don't know. Two minutes. Two minutes, right. In, in, you also have, in terms of how the role of the CJU impacts on uh, national law, there's two particular principles or concepts which you're probably familiar with. Um, all members of the ICEL will be familiar with them. The Marley Singh principle, whereby the National Court has to try and interpret national law in accordance with the wording and the purpose of the directive. Uh, Judge Charlton tried in UPC to run with that, but actually he got himself into a bit of a knot and ultimately uh, had to pull back from it. Um, so it wasn't used in the UPC case, but uh, it is used. I mean, I, 
it's increasingly used in Irish courts now and it's an obligation on national courts. And then there's the thing called the, which the CJU loves to call the autonomous concept. And the autonomous concept seems to be getting more and more uh, invasive in terms of its effect on national law. Um, for example, the, uh, fair, uh, the um, private copying exception is regarded by the CJ you know, as an autonomous concept. So it must be, and, and then they, they then seek to harmonize under the barrier or under the banner rather of this autonomous concept. In relation to the private copying exception, they've only said it thus far that it's an autonomous concept for countries that do have an existing private copying exception. So we're slightly outside the ambit of that thus far. But again, these are harmonizing acts of the CJEU. And then finally, um, if that were not all enough <coughs> to take in, we have reform on the agenda. And Eleanor has already talked about the communication towards a modern, more European copyright framework. I have to say, I was somewhat underwhelmed. I mean, it, it's been so hyped beforehand that one was expecting fireworks of some kind. And then you would go along to some venue, if necessary, to go to London to listen to Maria Martin Proud to listen to her, and she would give no hint of fireworks. But then that's not surprising for Maria. Um, and while she was, obviously, there was a certain amount of leaking of what was going to happen. In the back of my mind, I was thinking they're leaking the soft bits, but they're saving the fireworks for the actual event, for the real event. But when it happened, there are no fireworks, really, where exceptions are concerned. I know it's a stepped approach. Um, it's a softly, softly, maybe. But where the, named ex where the exceptions are concerned, it's really focused on, at the moment, anything that's been described is, is focused on, a pu uh, on public interest issues like disability, data and text mining for scientific research. And I agree with you. I think that already exists under Irish law, under, uh, if, if, we, if we change it, under non -commercial, for non-commercial research purposes. A greater clarity for cultural institutions and around illustration for teaching, all in the context of the digital single market. But they're soft. Those are soft by comparison with what we might have expected. The more meaty issues, the private copying levies, clarity on the scope of communication with the public, opening up the ISP liability exception, they're all treated at this stage in the communication in very vague terms, and uh, they're all somewhere down the road. So there's a great distance to go on that, and obviously the devil will be in the detail. Um, so maybe we have fireworks to look forward to, but thus far it just seems to be very softly, softly. Perhaps catchy monkey though at the end of the day. <laughs> so conclusion, my conclusion is, for, my, for your average target mm -hmm. practitioner there's quite a lot to think about. <laughs>